Today, we're talking about successfully managing your healthcare benefits when you're working. And also, we're going to be really focusing in on applying and all that information that folks have been requesting from Ashley. So next slide, please, Marilyn, um, excuse me, Karen. So today, these are the biggie things that we really wanna to touch on, difference between SSI and SSDI. Supplemental security income is a, is a benefit that you receive because you have not had any, you have not had enough credits paid in from working, or you have uh, not reached that limit yet to where you would be eligible to receive from your own record. So this is a means tested income and it's paid out of the general fund. So it's very different. It has all the little snarky hard rules. And then SSDI, Supplemental Secure, excuse me, Social Security Disability Insurance. And it is the money that has been paid in from a worker. It could be a parent. It can be the worker themselves, but that money is the tax money that you are paid in. So they have two different sets of rules, two different pools of money, and they are uh, two different complete programs. It just so happens that they both live in social security buildings, but they're really two different programs. Their working rules are different for each and their available work incentives for both and they are different. So this causes confusion when folks speak among themselves, well, I was told this and I was told that and can this is not what I heard. So most of the time, if you'll track down the source of the information, it's that we're talking about two different benefits. So that might clear up some of the misunderstandings that uh, we often hear folks talk about when they're talking about the work incentives and the benefits. Next slide, please, Karen. So we're going to talk about making this mental or checklist that, that is a good idea. It's just a logical way of dealing with Social Security because they're a big giant entity and we're all individuals. So this is a good idea to put this into practice. When you call Social Security and there's the 800 number, you keep a record. And you say, well, I really don't need to do that. That's not going to help me. It very well could um, later on when somebody says, I didn't call about, I, we didn't know. We didn't know that your address had changed or that this had happened. Oh yes, on this date and this time I spoke with this representative and here, here was our discussion. So if you can get in the habit of keeping a record with social security, it could uh, go much smoother down the road for you if you run into a problem. Make copies of all the documents you give to Social Security. Always think of it as, um, I, I tell our clients when we're working with folks, be sure that you think of Social Security like the cable company. You're not real sure if your payment got credited to where you wanted it to be. So you are looking for a receipt. You're looking for that proof in your precious hand that yes, I turned this in. Here's my copy, I have proof. So if you think of it as turning in things for a receipt, that will benefit you later, that's the idea we want to get across here. And you don't wanna lose your copies because why? Why is that important to keep? A year, 12 months, 16 months, 18 months, when you have a review, a different representative will come around and ask for the same information. So if you have it stored nicely somewhere in a pile, in a box, in a file, on top of the refrigerator, wherever your magic place is, your life will be much smoother. Those are, those are suggestions. Next slide, please, Ms. Karen. Also, another thing that I, I mend fences often with folks, um, promptly read all your mail from Social Security because it could be that you've got a 14 day limit, a 30 day limit, a 60 day limit to make an answer. And mm, that was mailed two weeks ago to you. So time is getting by you. So some things are time sensitive. So the idea with this checklist item is to be sure that you uh, look at all your paperwork. If you're having trouble understanding it, you have available options to help you read that social security letter and turn it into real English. You have the WIPA, you have uh, other support advocates, but if you're having trouble understanding what the letter's trying to say to you, then you can contact someone to help you promptly read it. 
Another question I get all the time is you must report your pay stubs to Social Security monthly. Um, the zip code of the payee is the office and how they match it. And if you want to know your zip code for your office that you should be working with, you can go to ssa.gov and in this little search box, type in office locator and that magic will pop up and then you put your zip code in and then the address that matches your zip code for the correct social security office will appear. And another fabulous thing that comes with that, I'm excited, is that it has a zip code. Uh, with your zip code, it has a fax number for this office. So hmm, if you wanted to fax in your forms and get a beautiful confirmation page from the fax that says, yes, I turned this in, then it's also another way to provide yourself with a receipt when you're turning in information to Social Security. If you later had to prove, hey, I turned this in. Now, if the Social Security reps say, don't fax anything else to me, then take their advice. But that is one option, mail, visit or fax how to turn in information and the individual fax offices are connected to zip codes you find them by going to ssa.gov office locator okay next slide please okay if a person receives ssi and medicaid that their resources and their assets the the money that they have in the bank uh, anything connected to DMV is considered an access, uh, excuse me, uh, an asset. So think along those lines. Uh, if, the, if you have a, a boat that's titled in your name, um, it could be a tiny fishing boat, you know. If you have a motorcycle, a four-wheeler, any of those things that have a DMV title will show up as a resource. And we don't tend to think of those things as resources. So let me just... Uh, help you remember that while we're talking about resources right now. Another good thing that we want to look at is your My Social Security account. Now I have one. If everybody, I would really encourage folks to get your My Social Security account. You go to ssa.gov and they even have nice little pictures to lead you through the My Social Security account. So why do you want one? Why do you care? Let me help you with that. You can at any time print off any of the letters that have been mailed to you. You know, did the dog eat one? Did you put it in the wrong thing and it got thrown away and you'd love to have another one? You don't want to call the 800 number. This is an option. Yay. Also, you have the ability to print off a, a verification letter. It's not a benefits planning query, but it would use for, um, you could use it for when you, um, applying for a, a community event or a community project. Anyway, I need to be able to show how much social security I get. This is a lovely way to do it. Don't have to ask anybody. You can do it at 12 o'clock at midnight if you want to, as long as you have a printer. So that are, those are two good benefits to having your own My Social Security account. Next slide, please, Ms. Karen. Also be sure uh, we're continuing the checklist, things to make sure that we get done, that you let social security know when your address marriage, you lose a job, divorce, children are born, move, whatever. You need to really report to the 800 number and to your local office. And we've already discussed on how to find your own personal local office. Uh, many people, let me just add this, they love to tell Social Security when they start working, and then they just assume that they will magically know that they are no longer working. So it is as important to tell Social Security your first day of work as it is tell them your last day of work. Especially SSI folks, Social Security loves to estimate they just are so happy about that. And they will continue to estimate wages until you tell them, I'm no longer working here. So this is a lovely reminder, SSI and SSDI folks, please tell Social Security your last day of work or if you change jobs, just report changes. If you're having issues on how to do that, those two numbers will help you, the local office and the 800 number. Next slide, please, Ms. Karen. 
Okay, this is a biggie that people often, uh, as I get many questions about this, what is the definition of disability? Now we're talking about adult, somebody 18 or older, the rules change. Before, when you're a, a child, they look at developmental milestones, but when you're an adult, they look at three, it's a three magical point, how hey, you have a disability. Now this is social security's definition of disability, not mine and yours, okay? This is their definition. You have a disability, it's expected to last more than 12 months. It, you're not gonna magically be better in three months. It's expected to last more than 12 months. And then the kicker is you are not currently able to earn more wages, to earn more than the current, changes every year, SGA, substantial gainful activity. So for 2021, that's $1,310, and we call that countable. So there's some things that you and I would look at as deductions that uh, really aren't, they don't call them, but we do. So um, the 2022, it will increase in January, it will go to $1,350 for the SGA. So what did you just say to me, Teresa? Three point criteria for disability. You have a disability, it's gonna last more than 12 months and you are not able to earn more than the SGA. So if you apply and you are earning more than countable SGA, they're going to say you're not disabled. There's lots of info involved in the SGA and we can talk about that later or I can help you later. You have my contact information. So, but uh, those are the definition for disability. See, that's not our definition, that's Social Security's definition. Okay, next slide, please, Ms. Karen. SGA is a way that uh, Social Security looks at the performance of work. So when other things are added to that in a support, uh, a subsidy, special condition, then those things are taken off as a percentage. So you and I would look at that as a deduction. Social Security has a different way of looking at it. And subsidies and special conditions can change the amount of SGA. Now that is a class all within itself. I would be happy to answer questions. I can also tell you that you can go to ssa.gov slash red book, R-E-D-B-O-O-K, red book, and all of the work incentives live inside the red book. Uh, it's about 70 pages. It has a great table of contents. So if you wanted to read more about subsidies and special conditions and SGA, there is a wonderful place to start. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit about initial eligibility and the determination and how Social Security goes about doing that. What do we need to do? Can you help me? Can you give me any advice? So let's talk about that. Um, you can, there's a disability report form and with that, it's an application and you can call and get your application started. You can apply online. You can apply through your My Social Security account or you can go to the local field office, you can make an appointment or you can call the local field office. So that's a, a lot of options. Uh, the interview, these are the steps. The interview is gonna take place and the information will be entered. The one thing I really want to help you understand is social, uh, social security will not know unless you tell them. Um, we have spent most of our lives encouraging, finding ways around barriers, uh, but we're all good at that. that. That's what we do. That's the world we live in. So now you come to social security world and it's, Marilyn calls it opposite land and I call it tell them everything you know land. So it's very different kind of approach. You really have to take your hat off and put a different hat on when you're applying for disability. So that is a consideration to keep in mind when you're filling out an application for disability for an adult. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Paperwork's gonna be mailed after you call and say, hey, I want to apply, or hey, I put this application in online. They'll mail it to you, a lovely hard copy. You're gonna be completing it and returning it in a timeline. 
extremely important. If you have trouble with deadlines, find someone to help you because they're serious about their deadlines, Social Security. A computer generated document will also gonna be mailed to sign for accuracy during the phone call. So it's not just what somebody said, they actually send you more or less, not really a transcript, but something very similar. So before mailed, copy all documents after they are filled out. So, okay, now you've called, hi, we've gone, we've typed, we've sent. And uh, they've sent us paperwork and, oh, we've worked on it. We're so happy about that. So before you send it back to them, be sure that you keep a copy of everything that you have filled out. I don't know if there's a dog at Social Security that eats things or what might could possibly happen, but you should always have a copy of what you send to them and uh, for your own records. Um, just be sure you get in a habit of that. And on top of the refrigerator, in the box or in the file, wherever you keep all your other things you're keeping copies of, be sure it goes there. The second interview is going to be set up after all that happens. And then they're going to talk, essentially talk about the things that are written down. Do they need more information? Was something unclear? They're not going to prompt you to tell them the wonderful things that we want you to tell them, but they might ask for some clarification. So I don't want to say the majority of the responsibilities on your back to tell them everything you want them to know. So remember to take off your advocacy, your helper, your uh, you can do it, your cheerleader hat, and put on this is, the, this is information that Social Security needs to make a good, solid decision. And the, I get this question a lot, too. I'm so glad Marilyn put that on the bottom there, cannot pre-apply. Many folks, when their kids are turning close to 18, they want to know if they can do something early. Reasonable, proactive approach. And the answer is no, that's not how they do business. So sorry. But uh, that's a sad thing to relay to you guys, but that's true. You cannot pre-apply. Next slide, please, Ms. Karen. Uh, medical history information is collected by uh, DDS. They are, uh, they are the part of Social Security that decides if you're disabled or not. That's a very big job. I've gone to some of their workshops on, actually it was by accident, it was great. I was going to a Medicaid thing in Abington and I went in the wrong building and boom, I got a DDS, uh, oh, oh, it's great. So I, I know some stuff now about them, I'm so happy. <laughs> the disability determination services are the people that decide if you're disabled or not. Your best defense, your best practice can be to tell them everything you want them to know. Don't assume anything. Well, they know about MS. I shouldn't have to write anything down about our daily activities with MS. Got the wrong hat on, put the DDS hat on that you need to tell them. The big thing about the accidental uh, workshop that I went to was it's, I did learn this. This was their main cry. It's all about functioning. What does your disability that you're applying for, with, to, at, from, what does it, how does it interfere with the functioning of your life? Now think about those things, communication, choice making, safety, self-care, all the uh, activities of daily living. That's a lot of information. And Social Security won't be like you and I will or won't be like Ashley. They're not going to say, hey, could you tell me a little bit more about this? They're going to take what you put down. So Remember to take, put the right hat on when you have the application that you're working on. Give them as much information as you can. They're also gonna look at work history. They're gonna look at when the disability began and they're gonna look at all kinds of treatments. So you are tasked with the job of the good bookkeeper that knows about the last doctor appointment and the last years of medicine and all that information. That's what they're looking for. And they're not going to say, hey, please fill in this blank spot here. Remember, you're, you're telling them what you want them to know. This is opposite land. Next uh, slide, please, Ms. Karen. Their DDS may request a medical exam. Now, 
we think that's going to be just this big, long, drawn out uh, doctor visit. More than likely, it's going to be a 15 minute thing and you're going to sit down with the doctor and you're going to say, we're here for a social security medical exam. And this is what we think. We think blah, 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 and tell them because he's a regular doctor doing his regular thing or a specialist doing his regular specialist thing. And he's not uh, fully versed on everything that's going on with you. So just, just be the happy talker and be sure and tell your medical review if you have one and your medical exam doctor, everything you want them to know about what's going on with you and your disability. Because don't assume walking into that 20 minute appointment that they have this giant history about you. So uh, keep that in mind and um, be, a, be a talker. Uh, determinations will be sent to the social security. They estimate 60 days, sometimes 120. We know that time uh, is fluid. Let's just put it that way. Eligible for benefits, you could either, you could have a denial. And then what's going to happen next? Apply for reconsideration. See, there's different stages. And then if you're denied at reconsideration, your next step is to appeal. Most of the time, if you want to know the real truth at reconsideration, here's what happens. There weren't enough uh, information about medicine or doctor. There wasn't enough documentation of some kind that they were really looking for. So boom, if you magically, you know, give it to them at reconsideration, then the tables could be turned easily without having to go through an appeal. That's my experience in the last 12 years doing this. That's been my experience. Um, I'm sure there's other experiences, but that's just an idea. So Information is critical, and I know it's a lot of work, but this is, they are not, just keep in mind that do not assume that Social Security knows about your disability, your disease, your situation. It's your job to make them aware, so you're good at that. We can get this done. Next slide, please, Ms. Karen. People often ask me about reviews, and they're talking about two different things. They're talking about a medical review can happen and a work review can happen. So folks get those confused and you can have both and it's okay to have a review. The law fed, federal regs say you have to have a review, but uh, it's required by law periodically to determine whether beneficiaries continue to be disabled. Some folks freak out at a review and here's my idea about the reviews. This is your opportunity. See, they send you that magic 821 work form if you're working or they'll send you another form. This is your idea is to say anything you wanted to to them all alone. Hey, this has been happening. This is my this is my situation. This is my illness. This is my sickness. I always tell folks, look at the medical or the work review as your opportunity to tell them what you wanted to tell them about yourself. Um, so don't be afraid of a review. It's not a bad thing. It's in the law. It's not going to change and it's okay to have a review. So you can breathe a little easier, okay? And there are two kinds, medical and work review. So next slide, please. Okay, Marilyn has decided that we need to talk about SSI and I'll be very happy to do that. Supplemental security income, there's a maximum federal benefit rate. It changes usually every January. It's based on the cost of living. This year, 2021, it's 794. In January, it'll be 841. That's the full benefit. If you're eligible for the full SSI benefit, that's how much it'll be. It's associated with Medicaid. Uh, in North Carolina, you get Medicaid automatically. Boom, you don't have to apply for it. In Virginia, you must make a Medicaid application, even if you get SSI. Well, why would that be? Because Virginia has decided that there are some rules about land and contiguous property that SSI doesn't even have. So uh, they're gonna double check that basically in uh, layman's terms is what that means. So you must make a Medicaid application, even though you're receiving SSI to get Medicaid in Virginia. 
A cash benefit is paid to individuals who are disabled and who meet the financial criteria too. So you could really be disabled and not meet the federal financial criteria and not get SSI. You could have more than the resource limit or you could have too much money or a spouse could have too much money coming in and you could not get SSI because of that. So uh, the rules are pretty stringent. Next slide, please. We've talked a little bit about Medicaid, but, and I've already said this, you have to apply in Virginia. Every state is not that way. Next slide, please. Uh, Medicaid and SSI programs, they both have resource limitations. $2,000 is the magic number for one person, $3,000 for a couple. That's for SSI and for Medicaid. The one good thing about Medicaid is that uh, they'll let you earmark a little bit of money for a uh, burial. And uh, you can talk to your Medicaid eligibility worker about that, it, usually around $1,500. And it has to be clearly designated as burial. And uh, so that, that's one good thing. Uh, there's also the ABLE account. And I think it's at the end of this presentation. Um, so. We'll be looking at that later as well. The resource limit is set by the, the regs, the federal regs, and it's countable real or personal property, including cash. Um, I always tell folks you can have one home, one car, but be real careful at the DMV if you're trying to help out to Aunt Sandy because she's in a hard spot. And if you would just put your name on her title with her, it would really help her at the bank. Those are the kinds of things that can come back to hurt you with SSI. Next slide, please. Why does SSI care about living arrangement? I think I hear that quite a bit. Uh, SSI is concerned with uh, food and shelter. So they're worried about who, how are you eating? Where are you eating? Where's this food coming from? Who's paying it? And how are you living? Are you paying your rent? Are you, do you own your home? Are you paying a mortgage? What's, those are the things that SSI is looking at. It's needs-based, remember? So their idea of functioning is needs-based. Uh, so when they're 18 years old, your, your folks have turned 18 now, and someone else is providing them food and shelter, it could be very possible, it's called the VTR, the value of the one third reduction, that you will not get a full SSI check. And if they're paying room and board, then they may receive the full 79. And you know, you have that talk with parents many times, they'll say, I could never charge little Susie for rent. Um, so that's a conversation you need to have because it can make a difference in their payment and um, because SSI is only looking at food and shelter. If you're wondering how their logic is, if they have any, or why they're thinking that, that's the reasoning behind that. Next uh, slide, please. Countable resources, stocks, bonds, IRAs, cash, savings, land that you do not live on. Are you, uh, is your name on somebody's deed in a long string of nieces and nephews somewhere? Those kinds of things. Anything on that is con easily converted to cash. Uh, resources of a spouse, resources of a parent if you're under 18. Those are things that matter for resources with SSI. There's also a great place you can look on ssa.gov. Just type in the search box, spotlight on SSI resources, spotlight on SSI, and you can get uh, a nice little list that will help you uh, maneuver those areas. Next slide, please. Here's a lovely little list. Uh, these may be excluded resources. A bank account that's a pass, that's a work incentive plan for achieving self-support, Earned income tax credit, IDA money, individual development account. Those are folks that are looking for education and a down payment to save a house and a local partner has joined to help, help with money. So these are your excluded resources. 
um, pretty nice, uh, but you want to be sure that you understand that the resource limit's 2000. That's the main idea with SSI. Next slide, please. How much can I earn and still keep my benefits? I think I hear that at least four times a day. And I think it's a grand question. If I, if it was me, I, that's the first question I would ask. If I work, will I lose my Medicaid? And is there a way I can keep more of my SSI check while working? How do I report to Social Security? Those really are the most commonly asked questions. Uh, the work incentives help you keep more of your SSI. Um, you can, there's really no limit on SSI. SSI is looked at every month. It will adjust your check and there is a break even point. If you want to know when your SSI will magically skinny all the way down to zero, just think of your SSI check times two plus $85 and boom, you have your break even point. How much will earnings will it take before my SSI check goes all the way to zero? That's the magic formula. People ask me that three or four times a week. So now you know. Next slide, please. Your SSI, your social security reduces your SSI by a portion of the income. And um, when you always gain more money from working than not working. So is that really true? Are you just saying that to me, Teresa? No, this is really true. Why would it be true that you always have more money in your pocket from working than not working with SSI, even if it goes, even if your SSI goes all the way to zero? The reason is the magic calculation that SSI uses. Most of the time when people are generally talking, they say things like two for one. And we just walk on like we know what that means. And what it really is, is you take your gross wages in a month. This is the formula SSI uses every stinking month. Every month, take gross wages. Here's my SSI. Here's my gross wages, not net gross. I'm going to subtract. It could be 85. It could be 65, depending on if I have another benefit. And then what's left, I'm dividing by two and I'm subtracting that from my SSI. There's my new SSI check every month. So you always have that $85 out of your working money and you always have that divided by two part in your pocket. So you will, it, the math, I can show you a worksheet. It really is true. You will always have more money from working than not working with SSI. That's why that folks tell you there's no earning limits it, because it's adjustable. Your SSI check changes. Next slide, please, Karen. One of the magic, magical rules that are work incentives are the ERWI, the impairment related work expense. Uh, people often have these expenses and don't realize that they do. Uh, let me give you some examples of an ERWI. You have to pay for transportation to get where you're going because of your disability, you're not able to drive. Okay, that's one. Uh, some ones that I have seen that I've helped folks with are I've had some kind of stomach surgery and therefore I take X, Y, and Z every month and I have to have it. It's really not a prescription, but the doctor said I had to have vitamin B and I had to have this and I had to have that. We can get a doctor's note, save your receipt, boom, you have an early impairment related work expense. Another idea you might not be thinking of is I have to pay $15 every month on my CPAP. Uh, it, Medicaid pays everything else, but I still wind up owing $15 every month. Are we? I have a bill I've been paying on for two years. I owed Dr. Uh, Zuzu, I owed him um, $2,400 and I've been paying him $50 every month and I had to sign a contract with that doctor's office. Boom, are we? So those are the things that might help you come along the line. So how does it really help you? The are are you really get a two for one bang with them. Like if you turn in a thousand dollars worth of Irwees and they approve all of them, then $500 would come off of their calculation. So it's, it's a well worth the effort, well worth saving your receipts, trying to get your mind to think on maybe I am spending some money that I don't think of on Irwees. 
The expense must be reasonable. We have to somehow or another relate it to your disability. Listen, if you can't get those vitamins and you can't stay healthy, then you can't go to work. We're good at relating stuff to disabilities. We can do that. And it must be paid by you and you turn it in at the same time you're turning in your receipts. Just get in the habit of turning those in the same time as your receipts. Next slide, please. One other beautiful, lovely student earned income exclusion is a, um, is a work incentive. If you have a student not age 22 yet, they're still 21 in six months, they're not 22 yet age 14 actually all the way up to 22 and they're working and they're in a program full time. It doesn't actually have to be high school. It can be a welding program. It can be a, it could be a, any kind of a program that they're in that that program considers the hours they're attending to be full time. Then they're eligible for student earned income exclusion and look at the limits. $1,930 a month is excluded as if you were not earning that da, 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 from your SSI. Uh, this is a work incentive you have to ask for. If you turn in your receipts and you don't ask for student earned income exclusion, is Social Security going to run up to you and say, oh, please, Mrs. Smith, ask for student earned income exclusion and we'll apply it for you? No. You have to ask for it. So um, I've got an opinion on that, that I'll be good and not say it. But we really need to be aware that we need to ask for that. So how do you ask? A simple signed statement. Please consider these receipts I'm turning in, as you're turning in your check stubs, for student earned income exclusion. Signed date. Well, I have a fancy form, but that'll work just as well. Next slide, please. Past is one of the oldest work incentives available. It has been around longer than any of the other ones. And here's what I tell folks about past. Past is incredible for people that are willing to put the work in. If you truly have a goal that you cannot get to unless you have this thing over here. Hey, I would be a plumber if I had A, B, and C. Pass is a consideration for you. I would be a great uh, work from home person if I had a computer that did this and did that and worked with my disabilities. And I am also willing to save money for this purpose. Then you are a great pass candidate. I would love to go to school to be an XYZ and nobody's going to pay for it for me. I need to uh, save money so that I can do this later. You're a great past candidate. Find a WIPA and work yourself silly for that goal. It's an amazing work incentive. Um, it's got some a little bit of work to it, but we're not afraid of work. So it's an idea for you if you have a goal, a work goal, an educational goal, and I can't get to it unless I get this first, and I'm willing to work for this and save money for it, passes for you. Next slide, please. This is my favorite one, and I really would have given it a different name if I was queen, but they didn't ask me. 1619B. Nobody wants that to be their name. It's the great uh, Medicaid for folks with SSI, and here it is in a nutshell. I'm working. Here's my work over here. I've got SSI, and I'm working more and more and more, and my SSI is going to go the way to zero. The very minute you are getting zero dollars for your SSI, because of working, not because you went to another country and stayed two months on a cruise that you won on Let's Make a Deal, not because your resources were over. The only reason that's acceptable is because of working. Your SSI went all the way to zero. Then uh, you can look at 1619B to keep your Medicaid. In North Carolina, it's automatic. In Virginia, you have to contact DSS and Social Security, and you really need uh, a, work, a benefits counselor to sort of navigate that with you, I think uh, it's doable. And you can keep your Medicaid with 1619B. Now, what's the catcher? 
What's the kick? What's the little snarky part of it? You cannot make more than 36,548 in that year. Okay, I've got a fantastic job and I'm gonna be making $46,000 if I really stay there a whole year. Well, 1619B can't help me, can anything else. Medicaid Works could help you. That's why your benefits counselor is gonna be working with you and asking you what your projected income is. So 1619B is a real thing. Over the 12 years, I have done many, 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 many of them. And it is one of the best work incentives for folks to continue working when they've worked so much that they get to keep the Medicaid. You know, we're not gonna work if our Medicaid is in jeopardy because it pays for all these therapies. It pays for medicine. That's $900 a month that who can real life can afford that. So yay, 1619B is one of the best work incentives there is. Next slide. Medicaid works, I said, hmm, what if I'm making more than that? Medicaid works might not help me. Medicaid works can also be used for someone that, what if my SSDI is just a tiny bit more than SSI? What if my SSDI is like $987? Is anything going to help me if I, you know, if I go to work? Medicaid works can. You can earn up to as much as $75,000. Uh, you can have a lot more assets with it. You can have a big resource a limit with Medicaid Works. And I have put the fact sheet and the, it's an actual presentation done by DMAS. It's a PowerPoint that is the second, um, the last uh, dot there above the Medicaid manual reference. Medicaid Works is the one thing extra that Medicaid Works has that 1619B doesn't is it will allow you to keep your personal care. Big deal, very big deal. So I would encourage you, if you think you would qualify for Medicaid Works, there's your research information where you can read about it. Contact a benefits counselor. You can contact me or, or Marilyn if you have questions about it. We'll, we'll be happy to talk to you about it and try to find the person in your area that does that kind of work. But we'll answer your questions for you. Just email or call us. Next slide, please. Uh, it's 10 minutes till, and there's a lot of information in here about um, ABLE, and I can't see the slide numbers. So can you tell me how many slides we have left so I can determine how much, what we need to talk about? Okay, there's, uh, there's 40 slides. Yeah. Yes. And what slide is this, Ms. Karen? You are on 26, I believe. Yeah. Uh, the pres Marilyn and I are talkers, I'm so sorry. And we're used to doing two day trainings where you're in there all day. So we love information, we're kind of nerdy and we kind of more than likely have stuck too much information in here. <laughs> so- um, Yeah, Teresa, Tia and I can, can go over ABLE a little bit too, so you can skip over that. Okay. So let's talk about SSDI, um, Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, there's a, that five month waiting period and folks are really, I got a call about it this early this morning. As a matter of fact, they really didn't like the idea that they had to wait the five months and it's federal regs. Uh, again, I'm not queen, I can't change it, I wish I could. Uh, then there's also 12 months of non-SGA. Now, what does that mean? Is that important? Okay, this is a biggie. When, when you get your SSDI, you have two dates on your award letter. So think about those things. You get an onset date, the date that they said you were disabled, and you get a date of entitlement, the date that the payments are coming to you. So the onset date is the one that we're talking about here. In those 12 months, and they will pin it down to the day, 12 months after your onset date, they have the option to do a look back. It's what they call it, it's in the regs, it's in the federal regs. If you are earning more than SGA, there's a whole section in the palms of social security regs about how, what kind of options that social security has to choose from. They could give you trial work period if you start working during then. 
they could not. They might not. They can decide that you weren't disabled after all because you're earning more than the SGA and you didn't meet their definition of disability. Mm, okay. The third option they have is they can say that this onset date is incorrect. We should move it. This shouldn't be the way it is. So here's what we advise because we're WIPA. Here's what we advise. During those 12 months from the onset date, not from your entitlement date, you need to be aware of your wages if you're working. And if they are SGA, countable SGA, then you, then Social Security has those three options to consider. Sometimes it's been two years since you've been, you know, you get your notice and you don't ha ever have to worry about the 12 months. Sometimes not. I did one last week where it happened very quickly and they had to consider those 12 months. So think along those lines. That's what that means. There's an initial uh, eligibility and, um, let me read this again, five months waiting period. We've got to worry about those 12 months from onset, not date of entitlement. Uh, you get your initial eligibility and during the EPE and beyond. Okay, extended period of eligibility happens after you use up all your trial work periods. And you're going to be looking at SGA. And here's what I tell folks. They'll say, oh, I've used up all my trial work periods. What's next? And I say, from now on, forever in a day, Hallelujah, as long as you and Social Security shall live, I pronounce that you will be involved with SGA. SGA is always going to be a consideration after the trial work period. So it's a big deal. Uh, it's not that hard to navigate and it does exist and it does not go away. It will go away when you reach full retirement age or you uh, change from a disability benefit to a, a retirement benefit. So other than that, after trial work, we're dealing with SGA. Another kind of Title II benefits, they all live in Title II land, childhood disability benefits. They are a Title II benefit. They all have the same uh, work incentive rules that go with Social Security disability insurance. And so do disabled widow and widowers. Those are the folks that live in Title II land and they all have the same work incentive information. Uh, Medicare comes 24 months after your, after your eligibility determination on that 25th month, then you'll get your Medicare. Uh, parts A and B and D, and you can, you know, you've seen the commercials on TV, you can sign up for the Part D that you like and so on and so forth. But um, Medicaid also has a program, MSP Medicare Savings Program, that will help you pay those premiums. So that's something that DSS, Department of Social Services, has. Childhood disability benefits are often also called DAC, Disabled Adult Child. You'll hear both of those terms, and they do mean the same thing. And in the regs, it's really odd because one place they'll refer to it as DAC, one place they'll refer to it as CDB. So they're both are the same things. It's not two separate benefits. It is the same thing. To get CDB, you have to be disabled prior to age 22. Uh, you're, you're married and get this to a non-Title II beneficiary, not legally married, unless or no uh, FICA than your parental record. So here's what really happens. Hey, I'm knocking on Social Security's door and their ideas, much like ours would be, who's going to pay this bill? So they're going to look for responsibility. Who's the responsible adult? Who is the responsible person for this record? Is it a disabled widow? Were they married more than 10 years? I mean, they go down their little list. If it's a child and the parent is disabled, deceased, or retired, then that record automatically opens up to the child. Have you been uh, in this community and you've heard that somebody got a magic letter that their SSI was going away and now they've got this new benefit and they're waving the letter at you? They didn't know a thing about it. They didn't apply for it. You're exactly right. That does happen. Those are called uh, DAC benefits, Disabled Adult Child, CDB, Childhood Disability Benefits, because another record that was attached to that person was opened up then that's how Social Security thinks along those lines. See, we really don't. They do. 
So if you're wondering where a DAC benefit comes from, that's kind of how that works. Next slide, please. CDB is a monthly cash payment to a child based on social security earnings of a parent for that adult child. So you could be 47 and get a DAC benefit. It's, it doesn't mean that you're a child. It means that the attachment of the responsibility is there. That's how social security is looking at it. You, the, uh, the CDB person was found to be disabled prior to age 22. A disabled adult child is entitled to half of the parent's benefit if the parent's living and three-fourths if the parent is deceased. If both parents are disabled, this is one time Social Security acts well. If I had a gold star, I would give it to them. They uh, will give you the higher of the benefit. Whichever one has the most money attached to it, you will get that benefit. Next slide, please. This is my favorite because I'm a nerd and I'm a formal Medicaid worker. So I have to tell you about special groups for SSI, the Pickle Amendment. The Pickle Amendment was a senator from Texas and Marilyn would be dancing because you know she was from Texas. So she's all about that. But uh, in North Carolina, it's called Pass Along. In Virginia, it's called Protected Medicaid. Protected Medicaid groups of people. There are four of them right there. Uh, if your 1619B payment for your Medicaid, it's a protection. You're gonna continue getting Medicaid, be thought of as an SSI person, even though your SSI is on zero. Uh, the pickle amendment with the COLA, you could be el not be eligible for Medicaid right now. And then a few years down the road when the COLA has increased and they subtract that, it could bring you down below the current SSI limit. And if your resources are under that, you could get full ride Medicaid. Ding dong, yay, very happy. And uh, the ARF, it stands for adjusting the reduction factor. That's all social security ease. It talks a, a widow or widow's benefit. The increased title two benefit from the widow widower caused the SSI ineligibility. In other words, they opened that magic record and guess what? That money was more than their SSI check. Then they get the letter. So that I'm sure that's happened to some of you guys. The disabled adult child uh, requires states to consider Title II childhood disability benefits who lose SSI eligibility as if they were still SSI recipients for what? just Medicaid purposes. So in other words, through no fault of their own, they lost their SSI. If their resources are in line, remember resources is a big deal. We're considering you this SSI person, so your resources still need to be under 2000, then boom, you could qualify for the SSI protected category for adult, for DAC children. What I personally do, if somebody really thinks that they should be getting this kind of Medicaid, is I send the page from the Medicaid manual with the person and ask them to apply and ask the eligibility worker, would you please screen me for a protected pickle amendment Medicaid? And that usually takes care of it. Next uh, slide, please. Medicare comes with SSDI, that's the red, white, and blue card, the A, B, C, and D parts. D is always the drug plan. The waiting period is 24 months, and um, there's no premium for Part A, and the premium is there for Part B. You're either paying it or Medicaid is paying it for you. Next slide, please. These are what we were speaking about before, Medicare savings programs. Uh, they're, they are nationwide, and here's the kicker. If you live in Maryland, it's going to have a different name. If you live in Virginia, they, uh, the MSP is in the Medicaid manual, but they refer to them as QMB, SLMB, and QI. So um, different states refer to them as different things, but it is in each state because it is federally mandated to have a Medicare savings program. It's just in North Carolina, it's got a really unusual name. It's called MQMB, and it's, uh, it's got a whole different name. So 
Uh, in Maryland, you have this. You can just look for it probably with a different name. Qualified Medicare beneficiary. Everybody that has QMB thinks they have full coverage Medicaid and they don't. Why do they think that? Because it pays their Medicare premiums, it pays their co-payments, and it pays all their deductibles. So in their mind, I've got full coverage. In real life, it does not cover Medicaid transportation. It's a big difference. A big important thing for some people like somebody on dialysis. So QMB is not full coverage, even though most of your customers that have QMB think they have full coverage. SLMB is the next run on the Medicaid ladder, special, low income, Medicare beneficiaries. And it, gives, it allows you to make a little bit more money, but the kicker is not going to pay the co-pays, not going to pay the deductibles, only paying the Part B premium. And QI is the same thing. It's just available sometimes and not available depending on what pool of money they pull it from. You can make a little bit more money and get you your, um, your premium pay, your Part B premium. And Ashley, I think that's the time that I have. I'm so sorry there were more slides than there were time. I could help you out another time maybe, uh, um, but I will turn it over to you. How's that sound? All right, thank you, Teresa. Oh, it's telling me I can't start my video. Um, I think this is probably, um, I don't, Karen, I don't see the rest of the, the slides. I'm thinking maybe this is a good place for us to pause. There's a lot of questions in the chat, I mean, in the, in the Q&A that maybe we can address. Um, so Teresa, thank you so much uh -huh. for your time and for joining us and, and we really appreciate it. Um, you're, you're certainly we'll have future sessions, so thank you. All right. Um, Karen, I don't know why, but I, I can't, my video won't start. Um, so I'll just carry on. And I don't know if, um, yeah, it's not working. That's okay. Um, we'll move on. So there are a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, and yes, we will send Teresa's contact information out to everyone. Um, so that if you have more questions for her, Specifically, she can answer those. Yep. Um, I don't know if Tia is still in. I know she was in the, the chat. Um, Karen, are we able to make her? Yes, I can. Yeah. Some of these questions I think she can answer. I've been trying to, to answer some of them in the Q&A. if she's joining as a panelist. There she is. There she is. All right, so Tia is, is now with us. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. You're good, good. All right, I'm in the middle of doing something here. <laughs> so what questions am I answering? So uh, there's several in here. So Jacqueline McKisson has several questions. I'll just kind of start at the top here. I've been trying to get to as many as I can. Um, and this question may be more for a CPA, but she's asking how does claiming a disabled adult child on her taxes affect her child's SSI or SSDI benefits? Should I claim him as a dependent or should he file his own tax return? How does claiming my disabled adult child on my taxes, it doesn't, so you're claiming them as a dependent. I do that, that's my assumption, Jacqueline. So I also claim my children as a dependent and it does not affect the SSI. It would definitely not affect the SSDI. Um, sorry, the question just vanished from my screen. Did somebody click answer it or something? No. Okay, it just disappeared. Um, here it is. Should I claim him as a dependent or should, yeah, claim him as a dependent, definitely. If he's your dependent, then claim him as a dependent. It will not affect social security benefits. No. 
Um, and then Julia is just commenting. There was another uh, participant who was saying that her son's, it was, I can't remember if it was a son or a daughter, uh, Social Security income was uh, discontinued because of the stimulus payments. Um, and if for anyone else that that may have happened to in August of 2021, Social Security announced that they would not be counting stimulus payments as income. Um, and they said that they would be retroactively reinstating benefits that were terminated. Um, so and I don't remember the, the participant who asked that question, but um, if you're, you're dealing with appeals, keep trying to contact them um, because that should have been retroactively um, reinstated. They should never have been terminated. So to, it was my understanding that that was for one year and the money should have been spent within the year in which it was received. And she was saying that it was, this happened in June. Right, June but, of this yeah, year. Back in August, they announced that they wouldn't be. So I, you know, I, the, the person said that they were working with a lawyer. Um, no. Was it June of 2020 or June of 2021? They didn't say, maybe um, if that person who had asked that question wants to pop back in. Uh, so, and give some so as I understand it, well, they did come back, like you said, Ashley, and say that it would not be counted, but it was for one year that they were not counting it. And so the stimulus money came in last year, May, June, July, sometimes that late, then there would be 12 months to spend it. And if it were not spent, that's when they would count it. And we got the second check $600 in January of 2021. And I never saw anything about that. I just probably naively assumed that if they said um, 12 months for the one, it would be 12 months for the other. Remember, you, can, you could be reimbursing yourself for things, right? When this money comes into your, the, to the social security rep payee account, you need to be drawing it out to reimburse yourself for any, any food that you've bought for the individual, the, the room and board, but other things like healthcare premiums, clothes, transportation, anything you're spending money on for that person's benefit, you can be taking money out of the social security. And I know it became more difficult because then there were no longer vacations or camping trips or whatever. Uh, the last alternative is to either put it into an ABLE account or a first party special needs trust if you can't spend it. Thank you. All right. Um, there's a couple of people asking about rent and how much they should be charging and rent and what should they be reporting to social security in terms of showing you know, proof of a rental agreement. So I know we have a sample rental agreement that we've shown people and Tia, correct me if I'm wrong, I think usually we recommend at least you know, $500 a month should be going to room and board out of what the person is receiving, is that? So 500 just for room, that's usually what I say is the maximum to charge 450 to $500 a month in rent and that's rent and utilities. Keep in mind that it's SSI is going up to well, how much is it, Ashley, next year? 800 uh, 841, I believe. Okay. So SSI, as you probably heard, is for primarily for room and board. So if you charge 500 for rent, and I'm just going to use a round number, or I'll say 841 for next year, that leaves $341 for groceries every month. And that's reasonable. If you charge, if your rent is too high, there's not enough money for groceries. And so Social Security could look at that as you providing assistance for food. So that's why I usually say cap the rent at $500. Okay. And we have rental agreement. We have a sample rental agreement. We have a sample roommate agreement as well. Thank you. Let's see. There are a lot of questions. Um, Martha is asking, will the report from the pediatrician for guardianship be sufficient for medical history? And I think that's gonna depend on, you know, how much information is in there. Um, and I'm assuming you're talking about uh, an application for SSI, Martha. Um, so maybe- And I would say no, um, you want to 
if that's the only document you're sending, definitely not. You want to front load the application with as much medical information and as many medical diagnoses as possible. And go back historically, you know, flat feet, hernia surgery, um, auditory processing disorder, speech delay, fine motor delay, gross motor delay, um, sensory integration disorder, anything and everything that the child has been diagnosed with and has or is affecting their functionality. You wanna list all of that and provide as much medical documentation as you can. They only wanna see the most recent IEP. And then you may also write anecdotals. I don't know if Teresa talked about that, but you can write about <clears throat> your child, the individual for whom you're applying and how they are not functioning as an 18 year old, 23 year old or however old they are. Thank you. Great. Um, Jacqueline has posted a couple of questions in the chat. Um, is application for SSDI retroactive to date disabled child turned 18 years old? If so, how far back does it go? In other words, the child, yeah, go ahead. Well, the, you're applying for adult disability. You're not really applying for SSDI. Social Security makes the determination as to whether or not the person will receive the Social Security Disability Retirement Survivorship or Supplemental Security Income first. That's just a pre-note. Um, it's retroactive to the month in which you applied. Yeah. Um, and then she's also asking kind of what, you know, if somebody has uh, a, a primary health insurance through a private employer that's gonna stay with the adult, you know, or, or the child throughout their lifetime, what's the benefit to applying for and having Medicaid? as well? Well, unless you're independently wealthy, it has many benefits. For example, if the child is hospitalized, so Sky was just in for surgery in September, four and a half hour surgery. I walked away with a zero balance, nothing to pay because Inova, for example, accepts Medicaid. So Care First paid whatever they paid and then Medicaid picked up the rest of the that tab. So hospitalizations alone, emergency uh, room visits, things like that, that's where it really comes in handy. And then in the long run, it picks up co-pays on medications. Most medications picks up co-pays at the doctor's offices, pays for durable medical equipment. So Medicaid usually, um, usually, not always, but usually you walk away with a zero balance, as long as you're using a, medic a doctor that accepts or a practice that accepts Medicaid or a hospital that does. So financially, it has a huge benefit. And if at some point you can't afford to pay those premiums anymore, Medicaid is already in place. Now, I know some of the people that have been in the government system and have the GIHA that is eternal, <laughs> Um, no matter what, that's, that's, then you don't have to worry about losing that. But yeah, Medicaid is just, it's payer of last resort and it's, it makes a huge difference financially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Eleanor is asking when an SSDI recipient qualifies for Medicare, will he continue to receive Medicaid? Um, potentially. And, potentially, yeah. So you can be duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. Um, if it's long-term care Medicaid, then most certainly you would maintain and retain that, that Medicaid because it's long-term care Medicaid. In regards to what's considered state plan Medicaid, so if there is not a Medicaid waiver, it's going to depend on how much income earned and unearned the individual receives. Yeah. Um, and then sticking with this Medicare Medicaid theme, Ava is saying that she never applied for SSDI benefits for her son. She received a letter stating that he qualified for it as well as Medicare, but they didn't want Medicare as they have uh, military benefits. They have TRICARE and ECHO. Um, SSA told us we could not turn down the benefits without paying a penalty. Is this true? Correct. So, I mean, why would you not want Medicare, I guess, would be the question I would ask <laughs> emanating my sister. Um, why would you not want Medicare? Even though you have TRICARE, TRICARE for life, whatever else you have, there's nothing wrong with having that, um, that insurance. And yeah, you have, it's an entitlement and you have to take it. 
You don't have to necessarily buy Part D for the medication, um, but I would, yeah, they do, you are penalized. Don't ask me why, that's <laughs> the law. Uh, let's see. Um, so Yoon Shin has asked a couple of questions. Um, and Tia, I don't know if you're able to see the, the Q&A as well. Her question is a little bit more complicated. It looks like she's still waiting on determination. Who are we um, looking at, please? Yoon Shin uh, um, Michaels, Mich I Michelle's. I can see. Um, no, I don't see that. In the Q&A, I don't see it in, in the Q&A. Yeah, I'll um, post it in the chat or I can just read it out, but my son has autism. I'm a single mom. My son had SSDI from his deceased father. I didn't know I had to file my son's disability when he turned 18. So I applied and did an interview with local SSA in September 1st this year to file for disability. The local office told me to continue to get father's deceased SSDI. Uh, he should be in SSA disability. I'm not sure if she means he should have a qualifying disability. Um, one month later, disability determination department called me after a short conversation. I got mailed the packet, which she completed. Um, haven't heard anything from them yet. Um, can yes, be so that is true. They don't yeah. tell us that we need to apply between 18 and 19 to reapply. Um, or let them be aware that the individual continues to have a long-term disability and that um, now that they've reached 18 or 19, that it should think, continue. Yeah, and I think she's asking, can he be eligible for SSDI as well as SSI? No. If I'm reading it's that question wrong, Yushin, please um, let me know and, and rephrase it. And everybody that's putting your questions in the chat or your comments, pop them over in the Q&A. Please, 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 please. <laughs> um, Yun Shin, I don't know if he can be approved or not because does he, if he has a long-term disability, then that's the determining factor, right? If he's a typically developing individual who, who was getting the disability because his father passed away, it does end at 18, potentially 19, depending on whether or not the individual is still in school or not. Yeah, but the continuation would be based on disability. Go ahead. I see you're up. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so in order to uh, get his uh, father's uh, SSDI, because so basically if he files disability, should be okay. But I didn't know it takes so many steps. So right now I'm in form of. Uh, the determination, the disability determination department. So, because my son has autism, he's, a, he's not severe, but he's moderate, but so handful because uh, I have no life for, for 24 hours because so, and then he needs a lot of need, anxiety, you know. So can he be approved for disability? That's my okay. yeah. As long as you have the, if they're asking you for medical documentation, make sure you pull together everything that you have. And when you talk to him, you don't say he's not that disabled. You say he is very disabled, um, because it's a needs-based system. Remember, this is the day where when we're talking to Social Security or when we're talking to Medicaid or any of these needs-based systems, mm -hmm. we're describing our child on the worst day in the last 365 years. But hypothetically, yes, Yun Chin, he could be found eligible for um, the continuation of the social security disability. So your answer is yes, maybe or could. Yeah, most likely. But I would, if it's still under, if it's it's you said it's you haven't heard back from them. So if you have not sent medical documentation, I would yes, get as much medical documentation, copy it, and send it to them. Uh, well. I you did. Yeah, so. Excellent, as well as a rental, well, if it's SSDI, you don't have to worry about a rental agreement. If oh. it were SSI, you would have to. So I sent to all the, because he's been uh, seeing the doctor since it, uh, uh, since we moved here. So he, I have all the records that he saw the uh, developmental doctors. So, because I, I heard one of my friends, otherwise uh, he is uh, re referred to go to see the psychologist. 
but I haven't got that uh, proposal yet. And but over the phone, the lady asked me, "Is his doctor psychologist?" So I just said, "No, it's a developmental doctor." So okay, then I will send you the, the packages. You fill up. So I fill out all the packet. So you know. Mm -hmm try to be honest uh, according to his need. Since then, I'm right. still waiting for his, uh, their, their determination later. So yeah, so my guess is, and I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that when they ask if the diagnosing doctor is a psychologist, they're looking more toward a mental health diagnosis as opposed to a developmental disability. And you answered correctly in saying what you did because you go to a developmentalist for his needs, his primary needs. Um, and then any other doctors he may have. So if there's anything you didn't send them, I would send it to them, but it takes them easily three months, generally three to six months to make a determination or redetermination. So you can call and fax and leave messages just to prod them if you'd like. Um, it may or may not help, but otherwise you'll, you just have to sit back and wait. Sit back and wait. Thank you so it'll much. be retroactive. So it'll definitely be retroactive to the month you applied. Um, you could potentially argue that it should be retroactive to the day that they, the month that they stopped it. But I don't know if that, that'll fly because they expect us to let them, they expect us to reapply at 18 or 19 or by 19. I okay. Yeah, I reapplied. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, there's a couple more questions. People seem to be uh, interested in the, in the rental agreement and, and room and board. Um, Amy is saying that that she was told she's called. She she tried to um, give SSA the rental agreement. They don't seem to want the rental agreement. Instead, they want me to tell them specifically what the housing expenses are for her son or what his fair share is. It seems where I do, do you, need. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm wondering. It seems Pop in the chat where you live. That would be interesting to see. So, because in Northern Virginia, for example, we use a rental agreement and it's accepted, and, and that's that. Um, you can potentially write down the expense. I mean, I would say if they want it written down, then I would say $500 for rent and utilities and, and the remainder toward food. That's what I would put in writing. And I'm lending him the money. So this is important too, because if they come back and say to you, well, how can you be charging them rent? So make note of this, everyone, listen to what I'm saying, make note. If they ask you, well, how can he be paying you rent if he doesn't have any income? You say, I'm assuming he'll be found eligible and he will pay me back, which means you're lending him the money. He will pay me back when the money comes to the account. So it's a loan. And then that way you, you get the full or that individual receives the full SSI. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, uh, hello, I'm Amy. Yeah, I, I feel I'm so unlucky because they, they want really detail. They want the gas, uh, insurance, uh, house tax, uh, garbage, all the detail. And then they say uh, after I collect all the detail, and then divide by four because I have four people in my house. And where then, do you live, Amy? Oh, I live in Springfield. So I'm that's so that's very unusual. That's very yeah, that I'm, has not happened in like 10 years that they were asking for that detail. And then, and I'm so frustrated because I fear the lady give you a hard time. And then well, yeah, what they're look whoever that person is, and again, it's they're just supposed to be gathering information, right? And then they sh they're usually not asking specific questions, but you ut under utilities is the garbage removal, the water, um, all of those those items. Um, what they're asking is whether what they're looking for is to see whether or not it's a market value that you're charging him, as opposed to what you would charge. What you can say is, if I were renting a room to someone off the street, or if I were renting a room through Craigslist, this is what I would charge the person. $500 for rent and utilities. Isn't and then I would say, and because this is my son or daughter, I think you said son, I can't remember, because this is my child, adult child, the rest will go toward food. 
Okay. Yeah. I would still send them the rental agreement I, and I would write that out and that would be the end of it. You don't wanna to give too much information. Um, you wanna limit the information that you provide them. So just send them the agreement again? Send them the rental agreement, $500, and then just, and then say, if I were renting a room to someone off the street, I would charge them $500 for rent, including utilities, period. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Ashley, I just figured out why I can't see the previous questions in the Q&A because I wasn't in as a panelist until 1025 or something like that. Ah, okay. okay. Well, there's people going. popping in new questions and I, we're not yes. gonna have time to, to get to all of these. Um, I'll I, stay think, on, I can stay on for as, as long as okay. I don't get a phone call that I'm waiting for. Well, I was, I was going to say and, and tell people we have some of these questions that folks are answering, we have already done previous sessions on. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we're not able to get to your question, please, you know, visit our website um, and check out some of our other pre recorded sessions or mm -hmm. contact us to schedule a consultation with uh, Tia or myself and we can. Um, answer some of your more individual questions if we're not able to answer them here. Right, and also the CWICs, right? The the yep. working set of coordinators are there to answer those questions as well. Yes. You can always yes. talk to um, DARS, Department of Aging and Rehabilitation Services, to ask where you can get questions answered. Um, and then we'll we'll send out a, a Q and A or FAQ after the fact, a good fact, a good week or so later. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of people just. Two more questions about the, the rent and uh, a little bit more nuanced. Um, and, and this has come up a couple of other times. Someone ha has asked me if uh, they're, they're charging their child rent, should they be claiming that as income on their taxes? Ask your CPA. Yeah. yeah. Most people say, yes, you should be claiming it as rent. If there's a roommate agreement, it's not rent, right? It's, you know, if you can show that it's, you're sharing expenses mm -hmm. more or less equally. But yeah, the CPAs generally say you should be reporting that as income. Yeah. And then um, a couple other folks have asked if my child, um, trying to find the question here so I can read it specifically. Uh, my son is 18. We do not have an official guardianship, but he's not capable of understanding or signing a rental agreement. Can we still use a rental agreement document that he's paying rent? And if not, how can we prove that he's paying us rent? He can't sign. If he's not under guardianship through the courts, then the assumption is that he is not incapacitated. So he can sign it and two people could witness his signature. Or if you, that, I mean, that's would be my recommendation. His, whatever his scribbles are or markings are on the paper and then two people witness that he signed it. Okay, uh, let's see. Christine is saying if your child, so we didn't talk about ABLE, so this is an ABLE question. If your child gets a temporary part-time job and earns more than the limit, can any of that be transferred to an ABLE account? Um, and then will the amount in the ABLE count against the $2,000 asset limit? So the money can go into the ABLE account, but it's still counted as income. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a direct payment from the employer to the ABLE, it is still counted as income. Once it's in the, however much is in the ABLE account, as long as you're using the funds correctly, it won't affect that $2,000 limit. Let's see. Craig is saying, DMAS told me that my Medicare Part B premiums will be paid directly by Virginia to Medicare, but SSA benefit verification letter for January of next year states that SSA will be deduct deducting Medicare Part B premium of $170 from my monthly SSDI amount. So you need to contact someone <laughs> yeah. to tell them that there's a mistake. And I don't know who you would be contacting. I need to see the letters, but that's incorrect. So a lot of, as you may have realized by this point, a lot of these agencies are in, are, don't talk to one another. So call, call them and tell them, start calling now. And again, I can't tell you who would have to see the letter. And I would, I would send to social security a copy of the other letter that says that Medicaid would be paying the premium. Yeah. 
and send it certified mail requiring a signature. Next. Uh, Ed is asking about his son. My disabled son is 43 years old and he may be eligible for SSDI in his own right because he has a number of years of employment. If my wife and I who are retired apply for the SSDI benefit based on our own uh, disability for him, would he be required to meet the SSI resource limitations? Um, I ask because he's married and his wife has a limited income of her own. That's a complicated so, question. I yeah. just see it visually. Um, bottom line, so he could, if, if your son is working, he's continuing to pay into Social Security. When he no longer works, he could potentially, he could apply for disability, saying that he's no longer working based on his disability and get Social Security disability insurance. If you were to, but he's married, so... If you were to apply for social security on his behalf, if that's what you're asking, remember he would have to have been found disabled prior to the age of 22 in order for him to be able to piggyback on your social security. Um, if, his, if when he receives social security disability, it's low, then he, and he was found eligible or he was found disabled prior to 22, he could potentially receive Social Security benefits based on his paying into Social Security as well as you paying into Social Security. But there's a dollar limit. So there's a whole mathematical equation on the Social Security website that would have to be looked at to see if he would get anything of yours and his. But at some point it maxes out and and I don't know what that number is off the top of my head. And I don't know if that answered the question. I'd have to reread it. I'd have to be able to see it and read it. I, I think that's um, what he was asking. Ed, if that doesn't answer your question, um, you can type, you can clarify in the chat for us. Um, there's a couple other questions about guardianship. Um, should I file for guardianship for my child before I file for SSI for him? Makes no um, difference. Yeah. Uh, also, when I file SSI for him and our family income is over $100,000, do you think he'll be eligible for benefit? So you're filing, if you're filing or applying for adult disability for the person and they are 18 years and one month old or older, right? So you don't apply, you don't, don't apply for them until they're 18 years and one month unless one of the parents is deceased or disabled and drawing social security or retired. Um, uh, they will look at his income. At 18, he's considered an you know, his own person, independent person. So it, it's, it's based on his assets and resources and not yours at 18 years and one month and older. So don't, so don't apply before that, and then it won't matter. Okay, next. And Ed is saying, uh, yes, that answered his question, and his son was disabled prior to 22, so... Okay, yeah, so you have to, so if what you can do, everybody, again, note everyone, note this, if you go to ssa.gov and scroll down below the pictures that says my account, and you can go in and, and set up an account, and it refers to your own social security benefits. If I were to come to disabled today, this is what I would get. If, um, what, will, what will I get if I retire at 65 and start drawing at 67 and a half, 70 years old? And so you could see your, have your son go in and create his own account and he could look at the numbers there and then that that at least would be the beginning of seeing how much his social security disability benefits would be and um, if you wanted to you could look on that social security administration's website to find out the limit or again call the CWIX. so Marilyn Morrison, as many of you know, uh, used to work for Virginia Access, and they, they did not get the grant this year. The grant went to the ECNV, the Independent Center, excuse me, EC, the Independent Center, or the Center for Independent Living in Hampton Roads. So you can contact them and get information from them. So that's the new Maryland, so to speak, is sitting in, in Hampton Roads now. And maybe Karen, if you make note of that, or Ashley, we can get that contact information because people can be calling them to ask the questions. Yeah. That's and answer. I think we've we've answered pretty much all the questions in the chat. Um, so unless anybody has additional questions, I think that that answers everything. All right, and then in the Q&A, 
I'm sorry, in the Q&A is what I meant. Okay, so yeah. you guys talked about the burial insurance effect SSI eligibility benefits? I didn't see that one. Where's that? Okay, so this, so Eleanor asked, does a burial insurance, it's at 1025 AM. Ah. Does a burial insurance policy affect SSDI eligibility benefits? No. And how might a special needs trust affect SSDI benefits? It does not, right? So social security disability is a, an entitlement based on disability and the fact that the individual was probably disabled prior to the age of 22, unless he's getting SSDI on his own work history. But burial insurance policy is, I believe, $1,500 in Virginia. I don't have the number off the top of my head for Maryland or DC, um, but that would not affect SSDI. But SSI, you want to make sure it does not exceed that dollar amount. Um, and then, yes, we're going to send everything out. Is there an order to apply for SSDI or SSI? Does one depend on the other? No, Cynthia, you're simply ap applying for adult disability. And Social Security makes the determination as to whether or not it's SS, if the individual is eligible, and if so, are they eligible for SSDI or SSI? Eva asks, and I don't remember this question being asked. Yeah, these are real early, these are earlier questions. I mean, they what? may have been questions that I was answering in the, some of them Maybe. I typed directly in. Oh, okay. So these you, ones don't show live answer. What? Let me see what you wrote. Yeah, I was yeah. answering those. Um, to folks as Teresa was talking, those, those questions were popping up. So you um, answered the security counting the VA payments that my veteran husband receives as income. Yeah, and she, Teresa was talking about that. So I said, you know, let's listen to what she was saying um, regarding uh, in-kind support, potentially. Right. Exactly. Okay, and then all the other, Giselle's question was answered. She's too. just, yeah, she just popped that one in. Um, I want to collect my social security benefits, but I know my daughter will then, and, and, uh, will have SSDI benefits. Oh, so, she, so it would be lower if her daughter were to take the one half. So if the SS, if she gets 50% of the 980, then she would get a combination of SSDI and SSI up to the maximum amount of SSI in that year. So 980 divided by two is $490. And next year, if it's going to be 841, 490, 4, 300, and whatever. I'm not going to do the math. I could, but I'm not. So she would get a combination of SSI and SSDI in that scenario. It might actually be a little bit more yeah. than what she's currently receiving in SSI. Yeah. Right. Well, no, she'll get the maximum in SSI. She'll never exceed I, that if mm -hmm. she's getting 50% of the 980. Yep. Um, no, so, so, and you answered the question, should I see a lawyer for application of SSI to get full benefits? I always say it depends on how disabled the individual is. Um, with my girls, both with Down syndrome and other diagnoses, no, I just applied online. If you have an individual who has a mental health diagnosis, those are the trickiest, right? Because a lot of times they can present as being fully functioning and capable, and they can hold it together for an interview, and then afterwards the world falls to pieces. So um, if it's a genetic disorder, or if it's obviously, you know, you have in-depth medical documentation or there have been multiple diagnoses, then you should be able to apply on your own. But there are attorneys out there that will apply for you. Um, and then they are, you may have talked about this, they are on a contingency basis. And so if they win the case, they get paid and there's a set limit by social security. If they lose, they get nothing. Okay, yeah, and I, yeah, it looks like you read through everything else. And there's a couple more that popped in. Mary is saying, to clarify, my daughter's 20 and receives SSI and the Medicaid EDCD waiver. I'm assuming she's meaning the CCC plus waiver now. Right. Um, unless it's the DD waiver. Uh, and Mary, maybe you can clarify. We have guardianship and she cannot work. Can she also receive child benefits once I become eligible for regular Social Security retirement benefits? Where are you reading this, Ashley? Uh, it just popped up in the chat a few questions ago. Yeah, okay, let me go. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm really visual. 
I have to read these things <laughs> unless it's like a super, super, super simple. This one, my child is 18 and has intellectual disability now. Who's it from? Mary Knight. Mary, thank you. Let me look. Mary, 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 Mary. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Read it to me again, please. I'm sorry. So she's she's saying her daughter is 20 and she's receiving both SSI and the Medicaid. She says waiver. the EDCD waiver. Um it, that could be the CCC plus waiver or the DD waiver. So Mary, yep, yeah, she's saying yes, CCC plus. Okay. Um, so she's receiving both of those. We have guardianship and she cannot work. Can she also receive child benefits once I become eligible for my retirement benefits? So when you retire and start drawing your retirement benefits, you need to let Social Security know that you have a child with a long-term disability who's receiving supplemental security income. They should then transfer her from SSI to Social Security Disability Retirement based on your retirement. And then she would get what's equivalent to 50% of what your Social Security is. So I always use the example, let's say your Social Security retirement is $2,000. You get your $2,000 and she would get $1,000. And then when if her father, when her father retires, if he's, if his benefit is greater, she'll switch over to the higher of the two, as Teresa explained. And when that parent dies, she would get what's equivalent to 75% of that payment. So you want to let them know, just like the other scenario, right? Don't, do not assume that Social Security will make the link between your Social Security number and your child's Social Security number. You need to let them know you have a child with a long-term disability. But yeah, she when you retire, you want to let them know so she can switch. And so she'll get SSDI, right? She won't get both. She gets one or the other if the if the DI is greater than what this that year's Social Security monthly payment is. Uh, and then two last questions, one from Kimberly, will a special needs trust impact a person's eligibility re to receive SSI? I missed the beginning of the question. Will a special needs trust impact a person's eligibility no. to receive SSI? No. Yeah. So, so special needs trusts are not considered income assets or resources. It's important when dispersing from the trust that it's done correctly. And that's what we're experts in, right? We know whenever it's going to, it could potentially jeopardize a benefit. And so that's when we'll get back to people and say, no, don't use the trust to pay for this. Use the social security or ask, ask the support coordinator at the CSB to apply for that assistive technology, right? But no, the trust is not considered an asset or resource, nor is an ABLE account. And the last question, and I apologize if I do not pronounce this name correctly, but Saley, um, my child is intellectually disabled, is 18 years. Can I apply for SSI? Yes, 18 years and one month. 18 years and one month, right. Okay. Yeah, now I'm, seeing, now I'm seeing what you're reading. Got it. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, this, this is Ava clarifying about the question regarding the VA income. We have a letter from VA stating that the money's not going to her son. VA only makes payments to veterans, not to dependents. The payment is to subsidize my husband for having to support our son. I sent a letter to SSA. They reimbursed two months, but are counting it as my son's income again. Who do I need to contact at SSA to fix the problem? So... Your son, Eva, is over 18. Karen, can you unmute Eva, please? We had specialists on last year in March, and I believe we're having them uh, come back again in March of next year about military benefits, um, federal benefits, and the cross the crossroads of the two. So Eva, is your son older than 18? Yes, he is. He's 36. Yeah. Veteran. And is this a new situation that they're yes, my, Yeah. My husband retired um, two years ago and um, had started receiving a, a small amount for 
providing support to our special needs son who still lives with us. And so Social Security backdated everything. And then, of course, said that we had had overpayments and got the money back. And we got a letter from VA stating it is not income for my son, but it is um, payments to my husband. And so Social Security fixed it for two month period. And now they're back to counting it as our son's income gig again. So it reduces yeah. his SS, SSDI. I, it should reduce his, uh, his SSDI. So it, it indeed, even though the money is going to the husband and it's meant to subsidize the son, kind of similar to whenever a child support go and the uh, child is over 18 and it goes to the parent, but it's really meant for the son. It is considered the child's unearned income. So I, hmm. I believe based on what I've heard from social security and what our specialists last March told us is that that two month period, that was a mistake on social security's behalf based on their law, their regulations or their procedure operations manual, that's considered unearned income to your son. And that's why they're reducing it. And there's no way around the VA benefits part of that. They, whenever they were, whenever people were advocating on the Hill to get the survivor benefit changed, to have it irrevocably assigned to a first party trust and not count as income, they did not include the veterans benefit piece. So I think that whoever made that determination for those two months was incorrect. And they, based on their rules, they do count that. Even though it goes to the husband, even though it goes to his yeah. dad, it's meant to support the son. All right. So we would have been better off not filling out that form and asking for, for it. Cause it's, it's a, I mean, it certainly doesn't help us any. And when, I don't know. Anyway. All right. I tell yeah, you, social yeah, security yeah. is the bane of my existence. <laughs> social security, I know it's such a good thing. And then it makes us crazy. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. But that's what they're looking at other, other for everybody. They're looking for other streams of income, whether it's earned or unearned for the individual with disabilities. So um, alimony may be irrevocably signed to a first party trust and not count as income, adult child support and SBP. And also, um, the funds coming from a birth injury that can also be irrevocably assigned to a first party trust and not be counted as a source of income, but everything else is sadly. All right. Well, thank you very much for clearing that up. You're welcome. And Amy says, my son was born with ID, but I don't know why on the SSI letter it said he started to be disabled at 16. I don't know why either. Um, Hard to say, Amy, it, that, what's important is that it was prior to the age of 22. Um, more information about ABLE. So the National Resource, ABLE National Resource Center, I think is the name of it, um, is where you'll find information of an ABLE, about ABLE. ABLE accounts complement many times special needs trusts. Um, so I would recommend going there. It's, um, they vary. Um, Virginia offers two types of ABLE accounts. You want to, to, if you're a Virginia resident and you contribute to an ABLE account, you can deduct up to $2,000 on your taxes. So you get a little tax break there. If you're Maryland, you would set it up in Maryland. You get up to $1,000. If you contribute $1,000, you get a little bit of a tax break break there. I just posted um, that website in the chat and I, I also sent that directly to the person that I, asked that question. And Eleanor, we'll take this as our last question. Eleanor yep. asks, hi, Eleanor. Clarification for my earlier question. I think I understood that my child automatically keeps Medicaid when Medicare takes effect if he has a waiver. Yes, that is correct because it's long-term care Medicaid. It's long-term care Medicaid. So he keeps that Medicaid. Good, excellent. Well, thank you for all the many questions. Uh, was longer. It would, would it be great? Would be great if this session was longer or broken into multiple parts. You know what, Jacqueline? That's not a bad idea. I don't think longer would be good because um, we do start losing people, and I know the focus starts going. But maybe making this and this internally, we can talk about this, guys. Offering maybe like a social security. Um, 
like a Trust Talk Tuesday type forum, right? Mm -hmm. Because you guys can always come to Trust Talk Tuesdays and join in and ask social security questions. But maybe we could do like monthly monthly sessions on social security and break it up into applying, appealing, social security versus social security disability or something like that. I like that idea. Um, yep. We'll talk about it. Won't happen this year. Um, but <laughs> we'll talk about it this year, but it won't happen until next year. Um, thank you for that recommendation. Uh, somebody says monthly SSA sessions sound great. Uh -oh. uh oh, we got a trend here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, we know it's a lot of information. Thank you, Ashley and Karen, for stepping up and um, manning the well, staffing, excuse me, staffing the, the webinar. Um, I was to go into a meeting at 1130, then it was 1030 and nobody's contacted me yet. So I'm glad I could sit in on this. And a huge thanks to Teresa as well for jumping in and replacing Marilyn, who had uh, an emergency situation come up at work. All right. Thank you, everybody. And everybody's welcome. A lot of thanks in the, in the Q&A and in the chat box.